And we are back on Sportsman Radio. I'm your host, Chris Schanfeld, and I am now joined by former NBA head and assistant coach who is a member of the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, Dell Harris. Thanks for joining me on the show today, Dell. How's it going? Everything's going well. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, looking uh, forward to talking to you here. All right, sounds good. Let's start the interview off by, uh, you know, I want to ask you what made you want to start coaching basketball? Well, you mentioned uh, the fact that I'm from Indiana to start with, and uh, when you grew up in Indiana in the 40s and 50s, why, uh, certainly basketball uh, was king. It uh, still has a, a tremendously high position among Hoosiers, uh, although uh, now they have uh, professional football there, of all things, uh, <laughs> which would never would have happened in the 40s or, or 50s. And, uh, so forth, but uh, uh, basketball has always been uh, you know, the, the big thing, really, in uh, Indiana, as I've said uh, many times over the years when asked about uh, why I wanted to be a coach, I said that when I was growing up, that um, if a person could not uh, become a basketball coach, why well, he would settle for something less, like being a, a lawyer, a doctor, uh, you know, a judge, uh, you know, something like that. Did you ever think you would coach uh, a few NBA teams? Well, I never really planned for it. Uh, of course, growing up, uh, originally there was no NBA until uh, after uh, the war, the, the World War II, and, uh, but I was able to see some of the early NBA games and so forth because Indianapolis uh, had a team early on and then uh, for a while they didn't and then they did and still do so um, but uh, no my goal uh, once I started coaching was to be a small college coach I uh, had picked up a full scholarship to play at Butler University to go to a NAIA school um, in Tennessee Milligan College and I'm proud to be a member of the NAIA Hall of Fame as well, um, by the way. But um, my goal was to coach a small college uh, similar to Milligan. And uh, when I was 27, I signed up to do that after coaching a few years of high school ball. Uh, I became the coach at Earlham College uh, in Richmond, Indiana, and did that for nine years. And uh, never did really have... Uh, much of a dream. Ultimately, at the end, I thought maybe uh, uh, Division One would be all right. But what happened was I started uh, coaching in the summers, uh, my last seven summers, uh, while I was uh, the coach at Earlham in the winter, uh, coaching in the professional league in uh, Puerto Rico. I had written a lot of magazine articles and uh, uh, and some books on how to coach basketball, and they had gotten around uh, over the, over the world, actually, and Puerto Rico called me and asked if I would come down and coach in their league, and so I did that for seven summers and uh, won four division titles and uh, won three national titles by, in my last three years there, 73, 74, 75, and because I was coaching against guys who were already uh, head coaches in the ABA and NBA, uh, one of the ABA coaches, Tom Nifolke, asked me to come and be his assistant coach with the Utah Stars in the ABA, and uh, that was the last year of the ABA, and the next year we went to um, Houston as uh, head coach and assistant coach, and after three years he went back to Utah with the Utah Jazz when they moved from New Orleans. And I became head coach of the Rockets uh, in 79. Now, your first year in Houston, you helped bring the team to the Western Conference semifinals in the next season, which was 1980 through 81. Coach Dell Harris and the Houston Rockets finished 40 and 42. Not a great record, but as we know, it seems like a whole different game in the playoffs, and you guys showed us that uh, as you guys came out to be the best team in the West and went to take on the Boston Celtics in the NBA Finals. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about that uh, that NBA season where you guys went on to the NBA Finals, Dell? You know, we're the uh, uh, team that uh, took a sub-500 record uh, uh, all the way to the NBA Finals and it had 
men down in France, and um, we were the last team in, and uh, again, that, that hasn't been done uh, either, so it was quite a, a ride for us. We finished strong and made some lineup changes uh, toward the end of the year, putting Billy the Whopper Pulse in at the uh, uh, the post with Moses Malone. We had the, the original uh, Twin Towers. They didn't call it that uh, until uh, later on. Olajuwon uh, uh, and uh, Ralph Sampson uh, played the, uh, the double post system uh, after I was gone, but uh, they called ours the Buffalo Ball <laughs> because we, we were a little bit uh, slower than that And can you tell us how different the intensity is from a regular season game compared to a game being played in the finals? The Houston Rockets lost that series four games to two against the Boston Celtics. Uh, looking back, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the experience you know that 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 uh, series gave you as, as a head coach in the future? Hard to say. You know, uh, that was my second year as head coach. I'd always had uh, good teams where, but man, Breyer, or I wouldn't have been there. But uh, it gave me the impression that. Uh, you know, this was going to be a little bit easier than I thought. <laughs> because you get to the finals your second year. It took me 25 years to get there again. Uh, and yet all my teams won made the playoffs. Uh, it just uh, didn't work out uh, that we were able to get to the finals again. And I've had teams that uh, won all games, uh, 60 games, and uh, still the furthest we were able to get uh, uh, was uh, the Final Four uh, until 25 years later uh, in 2006. This time I was assistant to Avery Johnson here at the Mavericks, and uh, we made it to the finals against Miami, and should have won that one, but we did it. And uh, so, uh, but... I don't know, I think uh, probably it gave me some sort of confidence. For one thing, it gave me a, a new contract. I was I was on one-year contract my first two years of NBA head coach, and then 
And after four seasons coaching the Rockets, you coached a little bit more than uh, four seasons with the Bucks. And I see in 1991 through 1992 season, you resigned from the coaching position with uh, the Bucks, who were at the time eight and nine. So early in the season, Dell, why did you decide to resign? Well, I was a general manager as well as coach, and uh, I felt like we had run the string out, and um, that uh, for two so two things, I was having a a bit of a physical problem, but uh, the, the big reason was that I had made an agreement with our owner and telling him that, you know, we'd made uh, the playoffs the final uh, my first four years in a row, the only coach in Milwaukee history to do that, as a matter of fact, in his first four years, and we, we did it with uh, an old team, and um, my... Um, uh, last year as uh, the coach with uh, uh, yeah, his last full year as coach I had lost uh, Jack Sigma uh, who had retired and um, we were trying to patch it up I brought Moses Malone back in who was uh, three, six or eight at the time and um, he had a bad back and, and uh, so that was a bit of a problem. And then my leading scorer, Dale Ellis, had gotten hurt on his back at the end of the previous season. And he had the operation, thought that he'd be able to play and just really wasn't able, able to perform. And so the, we had a, a team that was old and, and busted up. And now the last two years I coached, we beat Indiana, you can look it up, on uh, basketballreference.com, but we won both the games, that the last two games I coached against Indiana and against the Lakers by over 20 points. So it wasn't like, oh boy, you know, I, I've got to get out of this. I had made the plan with the, the owner that I would coach through the Lakers game. And then the, se the season lightened up a little bit in early December, and it would make it a little easier for my assistant, Frank Hamlin, to take over. But what we had decided to do was that I would go out and try to make trades and check fees, um, the draft as much as possible, because this was a draft where you would be able to get either Shaquille O'Neal or um, uh, Ewing. And... Um, it was um, a, um, a, a huge draft. No, it wasn't Shaquille. Um, it was, I'm sorry, it was uh, Pat Ewing or uh, the morning. And it didn't matter. This was the time of uh, coin flip. And so if you finished last, you were going to get one of those two guys. And it didn't matter whether it was uh, either one of them. You were going to uh, only spend a year in the lottery, and then you were going to have a guy that could teach you at a high level. And uh, so I set about to do that. But uh, then the, we did well enough that by trade deadline, we were still in position to make the playoffs. And, but the toughest part of our schedule was yet to come. And our owner decided he didn't want to make the trade that I had in mind. And so uh, we didn't. And then, lo and behold, we only won a handful of games after that and uh, drafted seven. And, uh, uh, you know, got Todd Day instead of um, either uh, morning or. Um, uh, Ewing, and so uh, the Mavericks then, or the uh, Bucks then spent, spent the next seven years in the lottery, and uh, I was out. But uh, I know it was a good thing for me, because then I ended up with the Lakers, but uh, anyway, that's that story. And, yeah, you mentioned it. You found a job pretty quickly, it seemed like, with the L.A. Lakers. And you had tons of talent there in L.A. You coached, of course, Shaq, Robert Ory, you know, Derek Fisher, Kobe Bryant. I could go on and on. 
But uh, Dell, I, I see that you know I've been ever since I've been getting ready for this interview. Interview, I seen that it, it seemed like you and uh, former Lakers point guard Nick Van Exel didn't have the greatest uh, relationship. Do you mind you know kind of uh, you know describing that for us? Yeah, well, that's that's uh, what true. Kind of, it wasn't the kind of relationship you would like to have uh, at that particular time. Uh, it wasn't as bad as portrayed either, for that matter. But when I went to the Lakers, they had been in the lottery uh, the year before. That's the only time the Lakers have ever been in the lottery. And so I, had, I didn't have the team you mentioned at that particular time. I had uh, uh, a very, very young team. Uh, and, uh, my veteran guy was really Bobby Devots, and he was probably 26. And, um, so I had Nick Van Axel, Eddie Jones, um, uh, George Lynch, Anthony Taylor, uh, and so forth, uh, Elvin Campbell, and a very young team, and uh, we won 48 games that year, and I became coach of the year, uh, going from uh, what has been a lottery team, and so then we made the playoffs again the next year, and uh, won 53 games. Uh, picking up Cedric Zavallos uh, in the process those two years as well. Um, and then uh, my third year, we made the big trades and moved out to several of those fellows, uh, and particularly Vlade, uh, in order to get Shaq and then to draft um, um, Kobe Bryant. And uh, again, we were still quite young. We made the playoffs winning 56 games that year, even though Shaq missed uh, 32 games by injury. And Kobe was just 18, but uh, we um, uh, then the next year won 61 games in each year and went to the Final Four. Uh, Shaq missed 21 games that year, so both those years, the Shaq had only, say, missed four or five games. We had had the best record in the league both years. We missed it by one game my last year there. Um, but we had the youngest team in the playoffs both those years, and um, we added Robert Ory uh, to the mix and Rick Fox to the mix as well um, in uh, that um, third year. So we had a, a really nice... Team. We kept Elvin Campbell, kept Eddie Jones, uh, and kept uh, Nick Van Axel. But uh, then after that, fourth year, we had the lockout. And when the lockout came, it was just uh, tough on that team. Uh, they decided to give up on, on Nick Van Axel and uh, moved him out, but we didn't have an adequate replacement. Um, Derek Fisher wasn't ready for... Uh, that kind of a role at that particular time. And um, so we were running at the, that particular position. And Shaq didn't play in the summer any of those years because he was still doing a lot of, uh, of uh, rap and uh, trying to be a movie guy. <laughs> and uh, when he came in to uh, camp at the end of January, uh, he way closer to 400 than 300 and uh, by a lot and um, he just wasn't ready to go. Robert Ory had a heart murmur and wasn't ready to go. Rick Fox screamed his ankle. We went 6-6 six and six, uh, the first 19 days of that season and uh, they let me go and brought in uh, Dennis Rodman. So uh, that season didn't finish well for them, and then they brought in Phil Jackson uh, to work with the team that had been a 61 game winner just uh, two seasons before. So um, uh, the rest is history. Uh, they've been a pretty viable team ever since. Now, I ask you that question about uh, Van Axel because I actually interviewed Van Axel a few months back, so I was just curious. And, you know, Dell, you coached Kobe Bryant during his rookie season. What did you guys see in Kobe Bryant, you know, the rookie coming out of high school, drafted by the Charlotte Hornets? Why did you guys want to get Kobe Bryant? Well, it's pretty obvious, I think. You know, uh, the whole world knew who he 
was, you know, what he had the potential to become. So, uh, that one cost us Lottie Diaz, who was uh, a great teammate and a, and a tremendous player, but obviously it was uh, a great deal. Uh, and uh, so, that was, we were, you know, you're betting on the future. Uh, you know, as far as Nick is concerned, uh, uh, I think perhaps uh, he was uh, probably forthcoming in that uh, he uh, probably wasn't as comfortable with authority at that time in his life uh, because of things that had gone on before. And, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, when you average 55 wins uh, a, a year, uh, things can be just too bad. And the flare-ups we had were really only one or two a year, and they were blown out of proportion. And every time that one of them came up, the media would remind us of the ones that had gone on before so that it looked like this was just uh, a lot more than it was. And uh, one of the big moments in his career uh, was when uh, they let him go at Denver, and we had the opportunity to get him, and Mark Cuban and Don Nelson left it up to me as to whether I thought that uh, we could deal with Nick or not, whether he was a good guy or not, and uh, having talked with Avery Johnson and knowing the changes that Nick had made in his life while at Denver, uh, I said, let's bring him on, and he had a wonderful year with us here, and uh, we, uh, uh, he was tremendous in the playoffs, and uh, just, he finished on a, on a very good note, and I don't know if he relayed that to you or not, but that's uh, the truth of the story with uh, Nick and me. Uh, it sounds good, and, you know, unfortunately, as we know, not too long ago, on February 18th, 2013, the owner of the Lakers for about 34 years, Dr. Jerry Buss, passed away. Del, can you tell us, you know, how your relationship was like with uh, Dr. Buss and, you know, how you would remember him? We always had a really good, uh, comfortable relationship. He uh, really left the running of the team up to uh, Jerry West in those days and uh, right up until the last year or so uh, there were some, some other uh, influences there uh, that uh, with his son and uh, so forth that they came into play but uh, primarily uh, Jerry West ran it and uh, Jerry Buss just came to my office twice once was to tell me that he was the most comfortable with me in the last two minutes of the game of uh, any coach he'd ever had. And uh, the other was uh, to say something about uh, some trades that he was, uh, you know, going to demand. And, uh, and we got those trades. Uh, I don't want to mention names at that particular point, but... Um, I used to go to his home uh, from time to time, just to have one-on-ones uh, with him in the afternoon. Uh, we did that, oh, I don't know, eight or ten times over my four years there, and um, I just always uh, was a good conversation, very positive. He told me a lot of things uh, that I can't even divulge, uh, but were quite interesting, and found him to be a very brilliant. He had a, a love for history, and uh, at Christmas time, my wife and I always uh, gave him uh, various history books uh, that uh, he appreciated uh, a great deal. He was a, a bright guy uh, and, uh, you know, changed the NBA uh, presentation of games from uh, just going out there and watching uh, a couple of teams run up down the court and, and play ball to uh, having a, a total entertainment experience for the fans, uh, whether that be with uh, the Laker girls or just other uh, promotional items and things that went on. And uh, he was a pioneer in that area of marketing the game of basketball. 
You guys are listening to Sportsman Radio. I'm your host, Chris Schanfeld, talking with former NBA Coach of the Year, Del Harris. Uh, coach, in 2008, you decided to come back and coach a bit, uh, a bit more, and you decided to be an assistant coach with the Chicago Bulls to help out, at the time, rookie head coach Vinny Del Negro. Coach, I'm in Chicago. I'm a huge Bulls fan, and uh, I got to ask you, how was your time in Chicago? It was terrific. Uh, uh, I... Uh really gave up a, a, a really good job here uh, as consultant to, to Mark Cuban. Uh, and it promised me a lifetime job uh, with him as, as uh, his consultant. Uh, because then he was a friend uh, and he, he, uh, I had already helped other guys start, such as um, Avery Johnson and so um I uh, decided to, to go up. They made it uh, a decent contract to do so, and just to help Penny get started. And um, it was turned out to be a great year. We were predicted to finish last in the division, and uh, we instead had a winning season. Well, a 41-41 season. I was fortunate uh, between 1983 and, and now. Uh, uh, I only uh, had uh, one team that I was with a full year that didn't make the playoffs. So uh, whether I was head coach or assistant coach, so uh, and before that, we'd already coached in the NBA Finals. But that still was a great run. And but of all those years, that year was a, a highlight year because we not only made the playoffs to beat the predictions, but that series that we had, everybody that watched that thing, I mean everybody, 90%, everybody I met said it was one of the most enjoyable, exciting uh, playoff series they had ever seen. And we yes, it was. Uh, went seven yeah. games with the defending champion Celtics in which there were nine overtimes, and we did it without the all dang. And well, they had injuries too, so you know Garnett wasn't uh, uh, going, uh, you know, on that one. And uh, but uh, Luol was very important to our team as well. I mean, it, it, they weren't the only ones that had injuries. So uh, and we had a young team, and and uh, boy, I, you, I I can still remember uh, Derek and. Uh, and Kirk and, and certainly uh, Gordon the way Gordon was able to knock down some incredible shots uh, and the way that the rest of the guys I mean Joe Kim no, I mean, what a wonderful competitor uh, Joe is and a great human being I'm just, I, I love watching those guys and I still pull for the Bulls uh, uh, when they play I love them I, I'm just hoping they Of course, in 2008, Derrick Rose's rookie year, uh, you were with 
the Bulls, of course. Last season, rose towards ACL in the first game of the first round of the playoffs against Philadelphia. And there's a whole lot of talk about whether or not Rose should even return this season or not for the Bulls. What do you think? If Derrick Rose is ready, uh, both mentally and physically, do you think he should return? Well, again, I just, you know, that my opinion wouldn't make any difference. I'm not there. And, um, you know, theoretically, uh, if everything is perfect, uh, well, yeah, you play. But uh, whether everything is perfect or not is really difficult to ascertain. It's up to Derek and the doctors, and they have the best doctors and training staff going. And those guys are fantastic. Uh, I know who they are, and I believe in them, trust in them. And whatever they decide will, will be based on the best information. But as you well know, the most healthy guy in the world uh, can still get hurt. And uh, so uh, I, I don't want to, you know, venture on that. I'll just trust whatever they do. Coach Dell Harris, how would you describe your 50-plus years of coaching basketball? Well, uh, interesting, uh, exciting, uh, and uh, certainly blessed. Uh, there's, I think, I'm the only human being that has ever done all the things that I've been able to experience, and uh, that is I've coached junior high, high school, small college, major college, ABA, NBA, FIBA ball uh, with two world games and one Olympics, and been coaching with five different nations, national teams uh, in uh, international competition, and coached uh, in the D-League, I've been a scout, and assistant coach, head coach, general manager, a consultant, and um, and all have written five books and made movies, and uh, it's just been an incredible uh, experience. It's not nothing that I deserved or earned. Uh, it was just there, and um, uh, uh, just thankful uh, uh, for the, those unique opportunities, and yes, I even coach girls. I could have my first job as junior high coach. I had boys and girls, so uh, I, I don't know. I was on the forefront of taking basketball, uh, coaching knowledge and stuff to Europe uh, back in the 60s and 70s, and uh, my time with the game uh, as a Coach has touched on seven decades, uh, seen the NBA go as a kid to now from nothing to just what it is, wonderful uh, experience for everybody. And uh, like I say, uh, not really uh, being boastful about it, I'm just being thankful uh, for having been given all these things. Well, Coach, what are you doing nowadays? I see you have your own book called On Point, Four Steps to Better Life Teams. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, you know, I'm general manager of the Mavericks uh, minor league team here in uh, the Dallas area. Uh, and uh, we have been since the beginning of uh, this team. That's my fourth year as general manager of uh, the team. I have been coached at last year, uh, the home games anyway, because we didn't get the kind of coach we wanted, and I had my assistants uh, coach the road games, and they, they, they developed into the better jobs as well. One's head coach of the nation of India now, and starting their program, and the others with the, the Hornets. But uh, in any event, my book, On Point, uh, you can find it on uh, Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com, and it's available paperback uh, there, not in the bookstores, but or you can get it on Kindle or Nook or iTunes, for that matter, and it's actually cheaper than you can get a trend paperback. And it's, um, what I do is take a lot of sports stories, which we've talked about some here, uh, not that are in the book actually, but, uh, and I apply them to everyday life and then I give them a, uh, a biblical uh, 
much as well uh, from the Old Testament and New Testament that uh, prove the points uh, that the sports idiom makes uh, in the subtitle, uh, as you said, is Four Steps to Better Life Teams. It, it could be Four Steps to Being a Better Teammate. And uh, what uh, we do with it is show how that there's kind of a point guard within all of us. That's why I call it on point. I take the the, the points that it takes to be a great point guard, and, and these are the same qualities that uh, one can use to improve their influence quotient, uh, their ability to influence others' ideas and, and attitudes and actions. Uh, they can do that on their life teams. You know, we're, we're a member of a lot of life teams. We're born into one, and and later on maybe we have our own, but in the meantime, we're not only on sports teams, maybe as we grow up, but we get on business life teams and uh, neighborhood and uh, civic uh, teams and church te life teams, you know, any in uh, homogeneous groupings or teams, and, and we all want our life teams to be better, and what I do with the book is not just talk about leadership, uh, because you're not going to have much of a team if everybody's fighting to be the leader. Uh, you have a leadership that respects the role players, and the role players respect the, the leader and one another, and they work together uh, to build one another up to have a great life team. Um, so that's, that's the essence of it. And uh, what you end up with when you do it right is having the best team you can have. I mean, it, you, you may uh, not win rings or championships, but you're going to end up with great relationships in those life teams. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand the importance of being a good role player. The point of of NBA championships is it's the role players that allow the star players to win the championship. They say you win championship with star players. That's true. But only when the role players are fitted in the right spots and doing the right things. You just saw that last year as uh, Miami uh, role players did a much better job than the, the year before when even though they had a better team than the Mavericks. The Mavericks had a, uh, they had a better talent. The Mavericks had a better team at that particular time because their role players uh, fit in so much better. There's nothing wrong with being a role player in life. 85 to 90% of the NBA players, most of whom make millions of bucks, are role players. Yep. Each team's only going to have one, two, three at the most that you wouldn't classify as just, you know, uh, the one or two, you know, roles that they fill best, and as opposed to being all around players, and and that's true in life as well. I don't care if you go and eat at a restaurant or you jump in a car that was made. You know, it it was the role players that put all that stuff together. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. On point, four steps to better life teams. And where could we uh, get the book at again? Amazon.com uh, and uh, BarnesandNoble.com. And you uh, probably, if you forget, everybody knows Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I mean, otherwise, you can Google me probably and get it. But as far as not for me, but uh, it'll just it'll have on there about the book. I suspect uh, at least if you put Del Harris on point, I know it'll come up. Uh, but uh, uh, I do have a, the book has a website if anybody wants to write it down, but uh, the advantage of going to that website is that I have a sample chapter, and of course, Amazon has a little bit of that too, but it has the table of contents, and it has uh, um, uh, just uh, uh, an overview of what the, the book is all about, and that website is point. LifeTeam.com, and uh, it, it has a little bit more. It has a table of contents and a preface and sample chapter, a couple of them. And, uh, 
Yeah, it's going well, by the way, getting a lot of good responses, and it's good for, not only for coaches, but, uh, you know, we're all coaches to somebody. It's, uh, um, coach is nothing but a mentor or a teacher, and we all should be that in our life to someone. So um, uh, I feel good about the book, and I, I think most folks will enjoy the stories and as well as the points. I appreciate you bringing it up, and uh, and uh, thank you for the interview. You did a, a really nice job. Thanks. Thanks, Al. I really appreciate it, and thanks for supporting me and Sportsman Radio, and I'll be more than happy to support you and buy a copy of your book. It sounds like a great read. Well, I appreciate that. Best to you, and uh, good luck with what you're doing. I'm sure you're going to be a huge success as you go forward. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, is there anything else you'd like to tell myself and our listeners? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I think you let me tell my entire life story here. <laughs> Probably people turned you off about 20 minutes ago. But uh, anyway, uh, maybe somebody stuck through to the end, and I appreciate it if they did. So you take care. Well, I'm sure they did. Thanks for your time, Dell, and uh, you take care as well. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>